why we started making our own peacock chairs. Here's a design that I wanted to reproduce. And I spent probably a year meeting different peacock chair makers and actually buying. I bought from every single peacock chair maker out there. And here was a design that I wanted to have reproduced, but nobody really wanted to make it. I developed this obsession with reproducing these vintage pieces after studying and researching what was available in the marketplace, and there was nothing. So that's when I decided that we were going to be reproducing these vintage pieces. And this one was at the top of my list. These were basically the first four styles that I was taking to every maker to see if they would make them. And nobody wanted to do it. The fact is, nobody was making this quality of a peacock chair. I traveled all over to Manila, to Singapore, to Indonesia, all throughout the U.S. And nobody was showing peacock chairs in general, let alone this quality. And so what I discovered is that it was basically a lost art of generations of ago and that new ways of making peacock chairs that were faster uh, had been instituted and this old way of weaving had kind of gotten lost. I met with one man and who now serves on the Indonesian board of Rotan as uh, as one of the chairmen. Anyway, so we had a long conversation. We got to know each other and it was it was great, great times um, collaborating with him and he decided to take on the order. And so little did I know, but he had actually taken the order that I gave him and gave it to a guy that uh, gave it to a guy who was making peacock chairs who I had not met. And I met, the way that I met him was really interesting uh, because I had gotten a message on Instagram from somebody in South America. And they were asking me some questions about what I was doing in Chittabon and in Indonesia. And um, the conversation got to a point where I realized that they wanted my help. They had ordered a container full of chairs. I think it was a small 20 foot container. And um, they wanted to know what happened to their order because they had spent the last three months trying to contact the maker, email, call, and so forth, and there's no response. So I told this person that I would go and check it out. So I did, I went and checked it out and um, went to the address that was given to her and it turned out that the factory had burned down. And I went in, I approached the the parameters of the property and started to go into the, the building where that had been burnt and was met by the owner and her husband. In that meeting, they told me what had happened, that they had, uh, their factory had burned and we don't know why, but a lot of Indonesians smoke, especially a lot of the makers and they do smoke when they're making um, the furniture. And so it could have been that. They also work with torches uh, to bend the furniture. So it also could have been that. But anyway, the entire roof was gone on this warehouse and they had lost everything in there. And part of this, this person's order from South America. I told them that I had been talking to their customer and they wanted to know why the maker wasn't responding with emails or anything to, to the customer. And um, I'm like, what do, you, what do you want to do? 
are you gonna email her? And then the maker asked me to do it, to email their customer and let them know what was going on. So I took videos and photos and stuff of the site. And then we were taken to another maker who was making this person from South America's peacock chair, peacock chairs. And all of this person's chairs were outside. There was no room for them to be in a covered area. And um, this, this maker that had made all the chairs had not received payment from the maker who lost their warehouse. So um, I informed the customer in South America and told them that their chairs were done. They were just waiting for payment and um, then the chairs would be released to the person she bought them from and then they could go on with finishing them and shipping the container. But there was a long delay on that order and the customer had no idea. Um, the customer from South America had given a substantial deposit for the chairs. And so anyway, I was actually happy for the opportunity because it introduced me to another maker who became instrumental in us making Amasis because we bought our first one from, from that maker. The man that was the chairman on the Rotan board of Indonesia, he agreed to make the Picar chairs that I wanted, these models that I'm showing you. And um, it turns out that he took them to this guy that I met who had made all the customers chairs from South America. Well, I had given a deposit. He was gonna make three styles for me. He started on two and the one when I looked at it, the first thing that I thought was, oh my gosh, it looks just like a penis. Okay, oh my gosh, it looks just like a, you know, a guy's sex organ. Okay, now looking at it, maybe it, it doesn't, but it, it did when I first looked at it and I thought there's no way because if I'm thinking that, somebody else has got to think that too. It just wasn't right. I just couldn't go with it. No. And so... I told my assistant, look, this is not good. And so he went back to the guy that we had an agreement with that was going to make the, the chairs for us. And um, he got upset. He kept the chairs, kept the models, and gave me my money back. Well, the problem that I had with that is that nobody's making this chair right now. And because of the difficulty of it, and so I didn't want him putting this chair out, even if it was wrong. My assistant found out who was actually making the chairs. And so we just went and talked to him and we said, look, you know, we want revisions on this chair. And he said, I can't do it. I can't do it because this guy's paying me. And so I'm like, okay. So then I hired him to make a brand new set of, of these chairs, which he started, but we just could never get to that beautiful frame and replica that we were looking for. And he got frustrated with the project and I got discouraged because I thought, they want me to accept this. They want me to accept uh, this, 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 this version and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't accept it. Okay, if you were to stop the video and look at it, you would see in many ways, it's just not right. I zoomed in on the top so you can see the difference and also the difference of Millie in the weaving material. That was one of the things that was a big push for me starting my own 
studio in Chirabon where we make the chairs. And so this model that you see, I've been wanting to make for about two years. And I actually had an apprentice make it because of my belief in him that he could do it. But it still wasn't coming out right. And after two months, the frame making on that, I decided we would just put it to the back burner, work on some other projects, and give me some time to think about how I was gonna articulate the details and the revision on that because, of course, I don't speak Bahasa, and so I wanted to be able to, to deliver the message on the revision in the clearest way. But we spent two months making the frame solid two months making the frame and it still it still wasn't there's there's still one thing that we need to to change on it and fix i discovered that whenever i wanted to have a chair made it wasn't going to come out like i wanted it to i mean they would get kind of a general you know hit some of the points on it but they weren't really trying to replicate it in the material the color the shape of the frame and um, the quality so um, that's when we just decided we got to do it ourselves and f from then from there on we've now started making several different models and these models that we're making have become our heirloom collection and the reason why this is important is because there there's different qualities of rattan furniture and it, it's it starts with the with the material of course and the quality of the material but also the millimeter that they use for making the frame and for decorating it, for binding it, just there's so many different details that go into it. And so when you're buying a, like a local quality peacock chair, what you're getting is pretty much a standard chair that you see that you've you've seen out there. You, you pretty much seen these chairs over and over and over. Um, and I can show you what they are. The audio peacock chair is one of them. But we decided that we wanted to make a chair that was so much stronger and that was gonna last for generations. And so that's what we've done. And we've done it with several styles now and we're continuing to do it. And so if you're on the website looking at the difference in prices and wondering why, there's a difference you may not be understanding it because you're looking at the color and it still kind of looks the same but it's not about that it's it's really about the the quality of the material and how it's made and the the di diameter of the seat and um, just the whole way the back is curved and the way the base is made and so that's, that's become what we do in our focus. And that's why the first thing is we make peacock chairs and we make a high-end peacock chair. That's the first thing that I wanted to tell you about that Home Festures does. So this is Akiati and he has to be one of the youngest peacock chair makers in the industry in the world and he went ahead and made this cobra chair and you can see how close he got there are some details though that will get it even better and that's what we're working on now but he did an amazing job and this is his first peacock chair this is hadi and hadi made the cobra chair and you can see it here i haven't got to talk about hadi too much but he has been making all of our heirloom frames and has been doing a really impressive job. Here again is another Cobra version that's bound and this is the original that we are replicating. 